He is the author of Black Market, an insider's journey into the high-stakes world of college basketball, which is available now at your uh, local bookstore on Amazon. We welcome Meryl Code onto Hoopsology. Thank you for joining us, Meryl. Thank you for having me. And Meryl, this book, I think, is really insightful and really in-depth. Um, Matt and I grew up with college basketball um, around it. So I think re- reading this book really brings a lot of perspective into just what we watch um, just on a weekly basis with college basketball. So what was just the motivation and just the creative um, forces behind the book? Well, you know, obviously, uh, for your well, I should say obviously for your listeners who aren't aware, I was part of the 2017 FBI investigation into what they called corruption. Not really understanding it was the everyday uh, business of basketball, um, and so you, you know, when the when those that are in powerful positions are allowed to create a narrative, that's what people soak in, and that's what they take up. Um, and so you're, you, you villainize folks for doing everyday business, and that business is actually helping people and their families. Um, and so because of that vilification uh, and because of the, uh, the courtroom experience um, and the lack of transparency in the courtroom that I experienced and my family experienced, I, I felt the need to really put something to paper that made this journey um, at least somewhat not necessarily relevant, but somewhat um, informational, right? And so I needed to, I needed for those who were, who were outside of the basketball space to really have an in-depth look into how this business actually works and how this system of indentured servitude has been allowed to exist for decades. And corporate America uh, seems to wash its hands of those young men and young women who are struggling to, to, to feed themselves or whose families can't afford to see them play and understanding what these people who are real people deal with on a daily basis. So because I experienced it not only from the corporate side, I experienced it as a player. Uh, and so I think I, I thought I had a unique perspective um, and the ability to, to, to talk about my, my, um, my evolution from uh, the, the player perspective into the, the business side. So I think as as fans, Matt and I, and casual fans of the sports in general, I think oftentimes we we take these athletes for granted and we don't understand their struggle. I, I mean, I did. And I, I went on a trip with a, a notable college basketball player from the University of New Mexico. And before then, I was pretty ignorant into just the struggles college athletes went through. And just him talking about his own experience really enlightened me to just – <laughs> really think he's being exploited, even though he was the star player of the team. And he right. played for a prominent school and he got transferred to New Mexico. And mm-hmm. I was just truly shocked. And to your point, I think the narrative of just the media um, really de- de- demeaning these players is just awful. Do you know when that narrative got started, you think, in terms of just players just, you know, I think not doing anything wrong, but yet the sports media, just the mainstream media, just really demonizing them overall. Do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and when you look at the the aesthetics of it, right? When you look yeah. at the the racial component that exists in the sport, um, you know, young men, young black men, and young black women weren't even allowed to play at these universities, um, and then there was a, a, a mad influx <clears throat> of African American players. Because they realized our athleticism, our speed, our ability to make plays that folks of other nationalities or races couldn't make. Now, now, okay, we can win with these people. Okay, so how do we control them? Because, again, it's, it's about control. We'll, we'll give you a scholarship and say that you're coming to our school, um, but we're going to put you in basket weaving as a major just to keep you eligible so that you can make money for us. Um, so that my coach can make four or five million dollars a year. We can we can take advantage of these corporate sponsors that pay us tens and twenties and thirties of millions of dollars on an annual basis. We have ticket sales and concessions. We have, we have marketing and licensing arrangements. We have all these other revenue streams yet and still that kid can't afford to buy a sandwich and he's demonized or the people that help him buy a sandwich are demonized because it's a control factor. Again, when I say indentured servitude, I literally mean it's an, it, it, and it still is. And I say that because people say, Oh, well, they have NIL rights now. Yeah, but that's a that's a band-aid on the bullet wound. Because not every kid is going to be fortunate enough to receive an NIL deal. There's not enough corporate money 
to go around for every kid that's on scholarship playing a particular sport. And my problem with the system is these same rules and guidelines don't, don't apply to other sports that, that, that aren't heavily uh, indoctrinated with, with, with black men and women, nor are they um, associated with those on scholarships in the academic world. And so if you're going to be on scholarship, be on scholarship. But you can't tell me it's fair for a kid to have an internship where they can go make a half a million dollars over the summer. But then it's wrong for somebody to give a family money to travel and see their kid play because they play a certain sport. And so, again, my experiences as a player uh, led me to write the book, led me to kind of give you guys some insight into, into some of those stories and anecdotes that I told um, during, during, uh, during the during the. The, again, the evolution of from the first chapter to, to the 13th chapter. Merle, you've, you've um, been no stranger to collegiate and professional athletics. Um, you know, I understand your family also has uh, a prestigious athletic background as well. Can you explain for us just how things have sort of intensified? I mean, you mentioned some of that evolution over time as far as this has grown and the ways that the, the control and maintaining that power have, have sort of changed. Um, can you just take us through like maybe what you saw growing up, like before you entered college and then your college days and professional days, and then being on the other side of things, just how has that sort of shifted? And um, you brought up NIL and we do want to ask you a little bit more about that as well, but can you give us sort of a timeline um, through that, those kind of eras and how this has changed? Yeah, I think, you know, as, as, a, as a young kid growing up, you know, my, my father was uh, a phenomenal football player. Um, and he grew up in a small town, Seneca, South Carolina, which is literally seven miles, seven or eight miles from Clemson's campus. But he wasn't allowed to attend because he was a black man. And so he couldn't go to Clemson in the 60s um, because they weren't allowed on campus at that time. So my father ended up going to North Carolina A&T State University to play. So growing up in a household where that was, you know, with that, that kind of messaging. And again, that's just the reality of the time. He wasn't bitter. He just said, hey, man, I used to work out with some of those guys at Clemson and they weren't better than me, but I couldn't go to that school because of the color of my skin. And so when you grow up understanding that you are you are viewed as less than um, because of the color of your skin, not because of your abilities, you, you start looking at the world a little differently. Um, and so I was again, I, I feel blessed and fortunate to have had parents who weren't afraid to have that real conversation with me. And they didn't shield my, myself nor my sister uh, from those conversations. And so, I, I, again, as a kid, you ask that question, well, why? You say, well, that's, uh, qu- the, the why is because you're black. That's, that's as much as I can give you. Um, and so <clears throat> that was one era. Um, I think this, the, 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 the evolution of television money really started kind of coming into fruition um, when I was middle school, high school era, right? So now you start seeing the, the, the beginnings of the branding of that March Madness, right? That, 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 that middle school, high school was that, that late 80s, early 90s is when it really became a thing. Um, and so seeing how it now jumps to, you know, a, a struggling event to now all of a sudden it's been branded and people are like, okay, what is this, right? And so, so now this television money kind of explodes from, you know, 10 million to 20 million to 500 million to that's billions of dollars of television money. So you kind of see that evolution from a, from a revenue game. Um, you, you introduce jersey sales, you introduce the era of the Fab Five and, and, and Nike making all of that money off the Fab Five and those guys, again, struggling to eat. And so those are, those are the, that, that time frame. Um, and then you, then I get to college and you see guys who can't afford to, you know, pay for meals on the weekends. Cause when I was coming in, c- coming through and playing in college, we got one meal a day on Saturdays and Sundays. We don't, you could only eat once. And so you expect guys to run, play, produce, and do all these things for you, but you want them to eat once. It's crazy. So, and then again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a violation when somebody pays for your pizza or takes you out to eat. You know, it's, it's, and so, you know, again, I saw guys driving really nice cars whose moms and dads were staying in the projects. 
but they're driving really nice cars because some agent, some coach, some somebody, right, was making sure that they had means to do whatever it is they needed or wanted to do because of their abilities. And so when you see coaches who, you know, leave one school, jump from one school to another, and there's no penalty for them, they can take a million dollar job on Monday and decide they want to take a two million dollar job on Tuesday and hey, it's just a business. But if that kid wants to leave, he's got to be punished. He's got to be punished for sitting out. Wait a minute. He's the worker bee, but he's punished for doing what what, <laughs> what the head coach can't do. I'm not going to call him the master, right? But this, so, so again, you, you see all of these different components. And then I think another part of the book that I really, to, to your point, Justin, is you got an inside look at what these guys go, and these guys, and I say guys and girls, men and women, what they go through from an emotional perspective, right? They're they're real human beings. These people are getting these kids are getting death threats because they dropped a touchdown pass or threw an interception or missed a free throw. Like it's real what these kids deal with. You know, I, I speak in, in terms of what I dealt with from an emotional perspective with my home coach. I mean, we were we were all kinds of names every day, right? And you deal with that every single day because. In essence, that's your job. So you got to go to work, but you're going to work to make other people money. Um, and so I, I experienced teammates of mine having to come home with me and eat on the weekends because my mom was cooking, right? Because I lived close enough to get there. So I packed my teammates up. We go to my mom's house and she feed us on Saturdays and on Sundays because we weren't going to eat again the rest of the day. And so I had teammates who never, whose families never got to see them play. Because they couldn't afford to get there. And if they got there, they couldn't afford to stay. And if they got there and stayed, they couldn't afford to eat. Meanwhile, your coach is making four or five million dollars a year and this kid can't afford a sandwich. And 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 I'm and people are vilified for helping families in those situations. You, you become criminals because of it. So Merle, I want to ask you, you brought up NIL earlier, and I feel there are some positive aspects to name and likeness. However, I do think it's going to be a loophole that's being exploited by the NCAA by <laughs> basically them being let off the hook by not actually paying their student athletes. So w- what is your impressions of NIL so far? And do you see um, any other negative um, aspects that are not being promoted through just the mainstream sports media? Well, I, I mean, I don't necessarily see there being anything. I mean, for me, I, I think it's great that, that these young men and young women are are having an opportunity to to to, to earn monies, right? Yes. But I also think if you really look at the big picture of it, it's still servitude. It's still yeah. it's still a, it's still uh, a control factor. Meaning, I am still having. I mean, and I want you guys to really comprehend and think through this. When have you, Justin or Matt, had to ask somebody to use your name? When have you had asked somebody if you could use your image or your likeness to generate revenue for yourself? When have you had to ask someone for that? The answer is probably yeah, never, never. Never. It's true. Hundred yeah. so percent. So, so tell me how this is in some 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 positive fashion. Where I'm still having to ask the slave owner, can I use my name and what I look like for my own personal benefit? So, to me, I'm again. I'm happy that these young men and young women are having an opportunity to earn for themselves, but it's in small quantities and it's not an open and fair market, right? So meaning you still have, and, and they state supported. Georgia, for instance, at one point in time had some kind of crazy state law where the school could take 70% of their earnings, 70, 70% of their earnings and redistribute that money how they saw fit. Now you think that's fair? So again, it's a band-aid on a bullet wound. Until it's an open and free market society and they can't cap these kids from going to make whatever revenue is out there for them. Right? That doesn't that doesn't stop the young man from coming to, you know, or young woman from coming to practice and and having to prove their worth, you know, as it relates to their playing time or team or whatever that is. They still got to perform and play, but off the off the field of play they should be able to go earn whatever is out there for them. Because for most of them, 90 plus percent of them, 95 plus percent of them, this is the highest earning potential they'll ever have. will be their four years in college. They're not going to play professionally. So if they can't capitalize on their abilities in this short span of time, they'll never get the opportunity. Yeah, it seems 
like there's there's so much messiness with this being tied into as you mentioned in the book like this idea of amateurism that has been around forever i mean since college sports started um it, it seems like there's just a lot of mess that could have been avoided had there been like minor leagues in these major sports like ready to take on the monetization from this becoming popularized on television espn etc um would you agree with that assertion that it's it's just a a bad fit for this to be tied with college in general like if we could go back in time uh, it's it's certainly a facade yes The, 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 the amateurism the entirety of amateurism as it relates to this is a facade, as it relates to college mm-hmm. sports. Um, and so, because <laughs> amateurism is when you're having to sell hot dogs and donuts and car washes to, 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 to raise money, right? To, right. To, 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 to put gas in a school bus, right? To get to the game. Or use that money to, <clears throat> to buy uniforms for the team or team shoes. You know, you guys are, are old enough to remember when that, in high school, that's what you had to do. You had to wash cars on the sure. weekends or sell cookies and donuts and <laughs> popcorn, whatever it was, you needed to raise $150 per player so that the whole team could get shoes, right? That's amateur sports. For sure. When you have coaches making seven, eight, nine, ten million million a year, you have, you have one entity that makes a billion dollars off of three and a half to four weeks of basketball. <clears throat> it's not amateur sports. It's not. And so, but they need to keep the amateurism status because it's their, it, it fits into their 501c3 non-exempt tax status. And so when you look at the totality of the business and you, and you realize the separation of business between football and basketball, excuse me, Jose, yeah. <coughs> excuse me, there's no March Madness for football. Why is that? Money. <laughs> TV ratings. Yeah. <laughs> Control. Yeah. Because football has had football is such a powerful entity that they basically told, can I curse? Of course. <laughs> sure. <thing>. Yes. <laughs> football has basically told NCAA to go fuck themselves. Yeah. Right? <laughs> We're gonna have ball games. We're gonna control these ball games. We're gonna tell our kids and our players and our teams where they're going. We're gonna align ourselves with corporate America. And you guys will have nothing to do with it. March Madness, on the other hand. The NCAA owns and operates. But again, for your casual business viewer, they don't really understand the difference. But when you're behind the scenes and you understand the business of this, you understand, okay, it's all centered around money. Right? So when you got coaches who find housing for families in a market so that that kid can attend that school, you know what I say? Great. He helped that family and that kid. Right. It benefits Agreed. him. Every, everyone benefits from that. Yeah. It's cheating. No, it's not cheating. If that kid accepted it and his family accepted it, who's he cheating? The kid's probably underpaid with the house. <laughs> no <more>. question. <laughs> yeah. When you talk about if you divide it up evenly, the, the program revenues that are generated from each of these high and powerful programs, no, these kids are absolutely undervalued in terms of what they make on, on the court, you know, for, for, or <clears throat> from a marketing or licensing standpoint. These schools can use that logo and license themselves out as they see fit. That kid can't yeah. because they need to control them. And they still even control them with transfers. They can block kids from transferring from one school to another. So you tell me what about this is not chattel as it relates to moving moving your buck from one one spot to the next. What do you think is going to be the biggest facilitator for change in <laughs> terms of getting uh, college <laughs> athletes from all sports just more rights to fight the NCAA? Is there any hope in fixing the system at all, you think? I mean, until, until, it, until it gets to the point where, I mean, truth be told, there's going to have to be something massive in, in terms of the young men and young women really kind of collectively getting together and saying, you know what, we're not playing. We're not going to participate until you guys make some necessary changes across the board, until there's federal legislation that says you can't continue to do this to people. There's no other business entity. If we're a capitalist society, there's no other business entity that operates this way. No. You can't name one. 
because there isn't one. And because it's we're, we're such a uh, this place is so hell bent on tradition that they're afraid of change. And they always come up with this bullshit about change is not necessarily a good thing. Yeah. But if you don't change. You die. Right. If you don't change, you wither and die. And that's what that's what will happen to the sport. Because if you don't, you saw kids at one time skipping college to go to Europe. There were high profile kids. Going to Australia, going to Greece, going because there was opportunities for those kids to, to, to earn for themselves and their families. And this place wouldn't allow that where other places do. It's a crime here when you do it. It's part of the system in other places. Do you see ultimately, you know, with with athletes becoming more and more business savvy, I mean, especially like your elite level athletes are <clears throat> investing uh, a lot more than they used to or, or at least than what we typically heard of, like back in, you know, 90s NBA, as an example, uh, what Justin and I grew up on. Um, do you see the potential, uh, just thinking of another potential solution, building that own infrastructure as sort of like a, a minor league and, you know, getting the elite talent away from the college system as, I don't know, a potential solution for down the road? Yeah. I, I don't know. I and mean, I don't know if if the farm system, so to speak, is, is the, the right, um, the right answer. And I say that simply mm -hmm. because there is an organic, um, fan base, right. At the institutional mm -hmm. level. Um, part of that tuition money is paid for those tickets to see these young men and young women perform. Or used to be some schools still do some some schools there's an additional uh, uh, charge. <clears throat> so I think that the system could work if it was just an open and free and fair market. Like don't don't hinder a kid from capitalizing on whoever he or she may be from an athletic perspective. Don't hinder a, a young man or young woman from making a decision to leave one institution and transfer to the next. If they want to transfer four times and somebody's willing to open the door to allow them to come into their program, so be it. You should not have the right to block a kid from going to a school because you don't want to compete against them. We should have played them when they were there. Right. So, again, man, the, the, the control levers need to be let off the reins. Stop it. Cut it out. And so I think the, the farm system is a difficult one because, again, it's got to be some kind of funding source and there's got to be some revenue generated behind it. it the, the G League or the D League, <clears throat> as it used to be known, um, really only exists because there's NF NBA ownership attached to it, right? <clears throat> the CBA didn't, didn't work because it didn't have NBA ownership attached to it. It worked for a while in some of the, in, in some of the mid level markets, you know, your B and C markets, um, but it wasn't a sustainable model. Because you got to have revenue to, to to bring these folks in, and so I think again, the model is the the model from a revenue generation standpoint and a visibility perspective are okay, in my opinion. I just think that they, they need to take the reins off and, and and allow these young men and young women to capitalize on who they are, if we truly are a capitalist capitalist society, and allow them to go seek whatever opportunities from a revenue generation standpoint are out there for them. And, and the other, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. Um, the, you know, I was just going to say the other side of this, too, that surprises me as well that there's not more outrage is it's not like athletic departments making more and more money, more and more profit is helping with costs of tuition or things like that. Not that that not that it would make it right for it to happen anyway, but it just surprises me that there's not more outrage and, and push for change. Um, given on the administrative side, it also seems like there are many flaws to look at as well. Well, again, what you got you guys notice as well is that the revenue generated from athletics funds a majority of the institution outside of athletics. True. So when they're when they're building new dorms, not just athletic dorms, when they're building regular generic student dorms or or, or uh, dining halls or computer labs. Athletic monies are pushed into those other, they, they pay, they help pay uh, professor salaries. So again, man, that's why 
it, it, it's crazy to me that you're taking from the kids that are earning the money and again, redistributing those funds to benefit others who aren't the ones out there sweating, bleeding, and dying in some cases to play these sports. No, absolutely. Uh, Merrill, one last question for you. What has been the impressions um, just from people reading the book? It's been out for about a year now. What kind of feedback have you received um, just through just the, not only college basketball world, but just the sporting world at large in terms of um, just laying your story to pen the paper? Um, a lot of positive feedback in terms of the, the story of the book, the intent of the book. Really, from my vantage point, like I said, it was a cathartic experience because of what I've gone through. Um, but the, the, the intent of the book was to make you think it was to help you understand. Um, it was to make you laugh. Right. And it was to piss you off. So I, I, it was, it was an emotional kind of journey right throughout the entirety of the book. I tell some really, you know, I think they're hilarious stories and I, you know, I try to open myself up and even be vulnerable on some of the dumb things that I've, you know, that I've done. Um, if, if you've read the book and, I tell a story about one of my former teammates in the CBA in a rental car, right? It's a hilarious story, but it was me being an idiot and doing something silly um, at a younger, younger age in, in my life. Um, and so <clears throat> it's not just hardcore hitting and me being um, this, this angry dude about what, this, what, the, what, this, what the system has done to me. No, I, I didn't want that to be, uh, I didn't want it to be a venomous attack. You know what I mean? That, that's not what it was about. It was really to open people's eyes in terms of how this sport actually works and how the business actually works and some of my experiences along the way. Um, and so <clears throat> it's been a lot of positive feedback from people saying, man, I didn't know that, you know, because I wasn't necessarily sharing those things. Right. That was part of what I did every day for a living. And so that was part of the everyday um, journey as it related to dealing with certain kids and their families and some of the personal situations that they were dealing with. And so years have passed, and so it's okay to kind of talk through some of those stories. Um, but but a lot of positive feedback um, in terms of how it was written, in terms of the anecdotes that were told, and the information, and the help helping them gain some understanding has all been really, really positive. Merrill, thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, can you let our audience know where they can find you on social media? Um, just please plug the book. Any other projects you're working on you want our audience to know about? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm the, the paperback edition of Black Market uh, just released. Um, the, the hardback edition, as Justin said, has been out for about a year now, but the paperback edition just released this week, this past week. Um, and so it's it's at your Amazon, Apple. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope you guys get a chance to read it. I'd love for, yeah. to, to hear your feedback. Um, I can be reached at um, um, Eric Elston um, at corgroupmanagement.com um, he's, he's kind of handling all of my, my stuff for me at this point in time so I'm, I'm really uh, appreciative of him and all he's done to help me as it relates to, to, to the book I'm, Javelin is my um, literary agency um, and Harper Collins is, is, my, is my publisher and John Glenn so I'm, I'm really appreciative of all those guys Matt, Matt Latimer and Matt Carlini um, and uh, um, Alejandro Denoy who helped me um, in terms of framing the the the, the wording and and, uh, and chapter gathering and all that kind of stuff, man, he's he's a he's a, he's a genius and amazing. He's at the Baltimore Banner, so these guys are really responsible for the book being um, in in motion and in play. And um, you guys can give you guys have Laura's information uh, at Harper Collins, so if they want to please give them Laura's information if they if they want to get a hold of it. Okay, we'll do. Thank all you right. very much, Merrill. Truly Thank appreciate you guys. it. Thank you. Appreciate it, man.